All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the afternoon portion of the 2023 Archives Fair. Uh, for those of you who are not here this morning, my name is John Lickloic. I'm the Vice President of the National Archives Assembly. Uh, and I just wanted to give a brief uh, introduction for the afternoon session. We're gonna have uh, some brief remarks from the Archivist of the United States, uh, Dr. Colleen Shogan. And uh, following those remarks, we will have uh, two uh, three session blocks in the afternoon. Uh, we'll have a, uh, a session on uh, a new exhibition at the uh, Kennedy Center. Uh, and then there will be a uh, session on social justice and engaging with marginalized communities at the University of District of Columbia. And then we will conclude our day's uh, sessions with an informal feedback session uh, with myself and uh, my co-organizer of the Archives Fair, where we will listen to all of you and uh, hear for what we did and what we could have done better for this year's Archives Fair. Uh, so, and uh, without any further ado, I'm gonna introduce the president of the National Archives Assembly, uh, Keith Owens, who will introduce the Archivist of the United States. Keith. We are really hoping that you are all watered and fed very well during lunch. And it is my honor and pleasure to introduce to you the 11th Archivist of the United States. Dr. Colleen Shogun became the 11th Archivist of the United States in May of 2023. On August 3rd of 2022, President Joseph R. Biden nominated Dr. Colleen Shogun to be the Archivist of the United States. The U.S. Senten, Senten, Senate, I need to get this closer. Senate confirmed Dr. Shogun on May 10th of 2023, and she was sworn in as the 11th Archivist of the United States on May 17th, 2023. Most recently, Dr. Shogun served as Senior Vice President and Director of the David M. Rubenstein Center for the White House Historical Association. She previously worked in the United States Senate and as a Senior Executive at the Library of Congress. Dr. Shogun was the Vice Chairman of the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission and the chair of the board of directors at the Women's Suffrage National Monument Foundation. She taught at Georgetown University in the government department and moderated seminars for the Aspen Institute. She is a previous president of the National Capital Area Political Science Association and served on the American Political Science Association Council, the governing body for this organization. Her research focuses on the American presidency, presidential rhetoric, women in politics, and Congress. A native of the Pittsburgh area, Dr. Shogun holds a BA in political science from Boston College and a PhD in American politics from Yale University, where she was a National Science Foundational Graduate Fellow. She is a member of the Pi Beta Kappa the Order of the Cross and Crown, and Washington, D.C. Literary Society, not to mention the newest member of the National Archive Assembly. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you all the 11th Archivist of the United States, Dr. Colleen Shogun. Dr. Shogun. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for that kind introduction. And everyone, happy uh, American Archives Month. So I hope you're, you're celebrating. <laughs> Every October, of course, we take the month to celebrate archives and share knowledge with each other and talk about public awareness about the importance of archives and the people who preserve and work in archives every day and, and manage them. And the DC Archives Fair, as I understand it, although I, as, as Keith said, this is obviously my first uh, time attending this event, brings together 
a whole wide range of archives professionals from around this larger DC region to be able to, to talk about and discuss what your institutions are doing, what you're accomplishing, what your challenges might be, and hopefully be able to uh, learn about some best practices across uh, organizations and institutions. So we're very happy to be able to host uh, this archives fair here at the National Archives. And once again, as I understand it, this is the first one that we've been able to host in several years uh, due to the pandemic. So it's a great accomplishment that we're, we're even here um, in 2023, and we look forward to many more to come. So I do want to uh, recognize our organizers of today's fair. Uh, we, of course, you just heard from Keith Owens, who is a preservation specialist at our National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis and also president of the National Archives Assembly. So thank you for everything that you do here um, uh, to help organize this, but also for your work at NPRC, which uh, helps serve our um, civilian employees and our nation's veterans, a really important component of our mission here at the National Archives. And John Legloic, which you heard previously before, before Keith, an archivist in our electronic records reference branch and also the vice president of the National Archives Assembly. And then also Lee Gelinella, is that right? Are you hear Lee? I'm sorry if I, if I mispronounced the, your, your last name. A digital archivist with the uh, Smithsonian American History Museum. She represents the Smithsonian Institution Archives and also the Special Collections uh, Council. So thank you for everything that you do. Thank you for, particularly for Keith for flying in overnight, and I understand you're flying back later today. So thank you for, for doing that. Here in DC, we are very, very lucky. Uh, we have such a wide array of cultural institutions uh, that are rich with our archival collections just in this city in Washington, D.C. It really does make uh, this fair possible. And that's not the case necessarily in, in every city that, that you go to across the United States, but we have that opportunity to do that here in Washington, D.C. And uh, if we have a little bit of time after I speak here and, and chat with you, I'm going to go out and look at some of uh, the exhibits and booths that we have out there. Uh, really, uh, as I look at the, the list of the participating um, institutions. Uh, I'm very excited to see what you have to offer and what you have to share. I will say that, you know, I've said this in many different venues, but I, I repeat it over and over again um, that as the Archivist of the United States, access is my top priority. And uh, in all uh, walks, uh, access can mean obviously access in the conventional sense, access to our, uh, our collections in person. And thank goodness we're able to do that now after the pandemic to have that in-person connection with our collections. And we want to welcome at the National Archives as many people as possible to be able to connect with our collections in person. That might be coming into one of our, our research facilities to be able to view those uh, aspects of our collection or records in our collection firsthand. But it also can be visiting this building and uh, looking at our museum and visiting our museum so you can uh, view a, uh, a representation of the records, a representative, of course, of American history. And then another aspect that we're going to be working on is being able to access as many records online and digitally as possible. And uh, we do this because it is an access issue, uh, whereas we open our doors and we would like to have as many Americans as possible come visit us here at the National Archives. We know that not everyone is able to do so, not able to even travel here to Washington, D.C. or any of our other 41 facilities uh, across the nation. So we find um, that providing our uh, records online at our catalog as a form of access uh, digitally to be a way that we can reach millions of more of Americans. Uh, so we're very focused on that. We're also focused on, uh, a lot of people ask me this, why? Why archives? Um, and maybe not people from the archival profession itself, but uh, you know, uh, people that I meet when I'm out and about uh, or uh, when, I, when I'm talking at dinners or um, uh, other things that I attend, receptions. 
in Washington, D.C. Or, or out across the country. So why archives? Why do you have to have a physical uh, location? Why isn't everything online? What, what, or also, what's the purpose uh, of an archive? And I think, you know, two things for me that really resonate is for, uh, democracy and history. And those are two things that I like to talk about uh, when I talk about the purpose of, an, of archives. Uh, as from my introduction, you know that I'm not an archivist by training. That's not my, my profession. I'm a political scientist by training. But that gives me a lot of confidence to be able to say that one of uh, the big reasons, one of the reasons that I get up uh, in the morning, I'm really excited about coming to work at the National Archives, is I view it as a, a keystone in our democracy and the continuing vitality of our democracy. Uh, one, if you read any, you know, uh, political theorist or anybody who writes about uh, democracies in general, not only in the United States but across the world, they will tell you that one of the key ingredients uh, for the perpetuation of a democracy is accountability. And there is literally no way to have accountability in a democracy historically uh, without having access to the nation's records. And uh, the, the National Archives, of course, is the repository of our nation's records. So we are a key ingredient in this institution for the continuation and the vitality of democracy. And all of you who work in archival institutions and facilities uh, related to cultural institutions and other organiz fine organizations across Washington, DC, that's the same uh, with you as well. So I, I find this to be uh, a really important point. It's kind of a simple point, but it's worth reiterating over and over again. And then secondly, you know, of course, the importance of, of history, understanding the historical record, uh, making sure that the historical record uh, cannot be forgotten. And that's something that we do here at the, at the archives as well for, of course, professionals that come in for all kinds of reasons, for uh, scholarly research, or maybe they're writing um, a play or, or something else uh, in the creative realm. We want to serve them. We also have a responsibility, and I feel this very strongly, uh, to provide an access to the best history education we can to our nation's children. And we know that the pandemic has been very hard uh, in, this, in this regard to our nation's children because we've gotten uh, the scores, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, we know that the scores are down uh, in areas of American history and in civics. And that's something here at the National Archives we can help with, but you can also help with across your institutions uh, to be able to bolster that interest in American history and, and foster that amongst our nation's kids. So all of this work is, is worthy of, of recognition and of thanks, and that's part of what we do also in American Archives uh, this month to celebrate American Archives. So this fair is a small way for us to champion what you do uh, on a daily basis, and uh, I hope you found it valuable to see what other institutions are doing and also being able to chat amongst each other. Uh, to learn from each other and uh, also sometimes not feel so alone because you might think, oh, you know, some of these, I know some of your organizations might be smaller than the National Archives and you may feel like, oh, I, nobody else has this problem. But coming together in a professional setting like this, coming together communally, always enables you to find out that you're not alone uh, and there are other um, archivists at other organizations that maybe have solutions that they're willing to share with you uh, that either were successful or or maybe not successful. Uh, and I hope that you were able to do that today and, and be able to enjoy that for, for the rest of your day here at the National Archives. So uh, I want to go out and take a look at the fair, but I'm happy to answer some questions uh, for a few minutes. If you have any for me, I'm uh, happy to, you know, I've been in the job for a little over five months, I think five months and one week uh, exactly. But I'm happy to answer questions about our directions here at the National Archives, what I see as challenges or anything, or any feedback that you might have that's, that's on your mind. Thank you. If you do ask a question, just if you could say what your name is and, and where you're from, yes. Yes, I am, yes, I am. The first uh, woman to uh, uh, be in this role 
permanently. There were women that served who were deputy archivists, including uh, Deb Wall, who's the deputy arch archivist right now, who we know served you know, for an entire year as acting archivist. So there were women that served in, in that capacity, but not a woman to serve permanently in the role and be presidentially nominated and, and confirmed. Yes, it's, it's uh, uh, in, incredibly important to me uh, that I step into this role as, as the first woman. I, I take a great deal of pride uh, in the fact that I'm the first woman. Uh, what I see a lot, whenever we had um, the Society for American Archivists, SAA, came here this summer because their conference was in Washington, D.C. this summer, we invited everybody that attended that conference to come here uh, one late afternoon and opened up uh, this building so people could, could come and, and, and see our exhibits. Um, and I gave some short remarks. Uh, and uh, I had a real a long line of archivists uh, actually to get pictures with me. And not all, everyone, but a large majority of those uh, people in line were women. And what I heard time and time again when they came up to take a picture with me, a photo with me, was that that really mattered to them. And I think that uh, when, what you see in cultural institutions, whether it's archives or libraries or museums, historically, although things are, are definitely changing, what you see is that uh, a lot of those professions that work in those uh, institutions, sometimes they're called glam, right, that work in those institutions are women. Uh, that, that are uh, you know, curators or archivists or librarians or museum experts, exhibits experts, historians. A lot of them, uh, public historians, are women, but uh, traditionally and historically, the people that run those organizations, uh, who are the president, CEOs, or, or whatnot, um, are, are usually not women. <laughs> so they're, you know, uh, and uh, so it's one of those interesting professions dominated by women, uh, but without, uh, uh, unfortunately, without a lot of leadership by women at the top uh, of the echelon. And I've talked a lot with Carla Hayden about this, who was the first, I, I worked at the library when she came on board, first African American to serve in that role, and first woman. But she, and she felt very strongly about both. Uh, but she said what really, uh, what mattered a lot in the librarian profession was in fact that she was the first woman since so many librarians across the country are women but typically didn't see women in those top positions, whether it was a public library or a state library or, or a university library, whatever the case may be. And I suspect this is the same thing, um, very similar in the archives profession. So I, I take that to heart. I'm glad, I'm happy that I I was uh, be able to serve as the first woman, and I guarantee you I will not be the last. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. so I I mean, you can always reach out to my office. Our, our contact information is online, uh, and uh, if it was appropriate, that if it was a tour, it might be arranged out of my office, the archivist office. It depends on what you know they're looking for. Uh, something you know, uh, more of a professional interaction concerning the archival. Um, uh, archival practices, then we would reach out to what would be most relevant here at the National Archives and try to arrange that. But certainly we're happy in my, or my office to be the conduit, at least for the initial inquiry, and then we would find the relevant um, component within the very large National Archives structure uh, to which to, to work with on, on that matter. But absolutely, we're, we're happy to do that. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. 
Right, uh, yeah. So it's a good question because just to give you a, a sense of what we're dealing with at, at the National Archives, um, right now we have about 13 and a half billion records. I'm talking about paper, or, you know, or analog records, right? About 13 and a half billion is, is the number that I've been told to use that is, it's, it's an approximation, obviously, but we're pretty confident in, in that uh, general number. And a little over, I think about 250 million um, are online in the catalog, okay? So uh, it's a good, I mean, that's, that's an, a really impressive amount to be in our catalog online, uh, but that's not, you know, 13.5 billion, okay? So we have to make choices. Uh, some people say, oh, we'll digitize it all. You know, you get those questions all the time. Uh, and you have to explain why that, that would be very challenging just to start from the beginning and, and just go all the way through. It's much better to make a, a, some, some prioritization choices as you go along. One thing that we uh, have done at the National Archives is prioritize um, records that, have, um, that are, are of, of great interest to previously underrepresented groups. And we work with uh, some of those groups to help, us, to help identify for us which records they would want to see digitized, which would be most helpful to them. I'm going to Seattle tomorrow. Uh, one of our uh, National Archives facilities is in Seattle. And that is the place where we house uh, all of our Alaska Native records, okay? Previously, we're in Alaska, that facility closed, and so those records physically moved to Seattle. And now we are moving those records temporarily to, um, to College Park, where we have a lot of uh, higher speed digitization capabilities to digitize those records, then they will go back to Seattle uh, once they are digitized. But that's a good example of an under previously underrepresented group that has identified records that will be very useful to them uh, if they are avail available digitally. So that's one group. And then another group of, of records that we will, which would just sort of make sense, that we would prioritize for digitization are high use records. So records that have wide interest um, uh, to the American public, that can mean a lot of different things, um, you know, uh, some of our presidential records at our presidential libraries obviously have, are, are of great interest, uh, for example, and we would prioritize digitization of, of highly requested or highly used items so that more people can have access to them. Now, there's, there might be other criteria, but those are two groups, okay? So I'm not saying that's the only groups, but those are, uh, there's an example there. Anybody else? Yes. Hi, I work with the National Council for the Social Studies. Yes, yeah. I was wondering how do you have such organizations that are interested in the education of children? How do we shape archival theories to our history programs? Yeah, I think it's through, and the National Archives actually does a really good job of this, but it's it's all about getting our primary documents, in this case for the National Archives records, getting them uh, online, um, digitized, and providing the right contextual information so that teachers find it very easy if they are teaching a unit on World War II that we have uh, ready-made uh, records relevant to World War II. For example, um, the other day I saw the amazing aerial flight map of um, actually the Japanese um, fighters coming in to Pearl Harbor. Uh, and the person that was actually keeping track, wasn't done digitally back then, actually keeping track of the planes that were coming in. And then of course, at a certain point of time, realizing what, what had happened. But boy, you have a almost emotional reaction when you see uh, that primary source uh, document. You could study Pearl Harbor you know, and read about it in a textbook and, and read about what happened that day uh, as much as you want. But when you see that record, when you see that come to life, you really get a sense of, of, of what was happening that day uh, in Hawaii and, and the instigation, of course, for U.S. entry into World War II. So I think um, having interact, that was an in-person interaction, but you could, you know, have that, that document on that record online. Uh, so it can be brought up in a classroom, hopefully, you know, the ability to be able to, for kids to see that on their uh, think pads right in front of them, or have it uh, in the front of a classroom that a teacher is able to refer to and tell that story. I think that's really important. I, I'm, 
I love like suffragists, I like the women's suffrage movement, but being able to tell the stories of those women, many of them who went to prison for uh, uh, you know, considerable uh, periods of time um, at, uh, at a prison, you know, not too far down the road, 25 miles, miles down 95, uh, I located, I mean, now 95 is there, it wasn't there when they were there, but uh, I, you know, uh, but be able to tell the stories of what, you know, what their backgrounds were and why they felt so strongly that women deserve the right to vote that really will resonate with kids better than just saying, ah, oh, the 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote. Okay, yeah, that's factually correct, and it's not bad to, tell, to have that factual information, but being able to tell those stories in an interesting way, to have that almost emotional connection to uh, the background will get kids, I think, interested in history. And we do do that uh, at the National Archives, and we want to do more of it. Um, I think we do a terrific job with our substance. What we're trying to work on as much as possible is having the outreach to uh, organizations like yours so that we have, for example, social studies teachers that when they're teaching a unit on a particular era, a particular moment in time in American history, they think, okay, let me look at the National Archives website and find out what I can, um, what they have available for me that I'm able to incorporate into my lesson plan as I go along. I have one more, okay. Hi, I'm Joanna Kelly, and I am a librarian in the Archivist at San Jose Friends School, which is a small okay. private K through 12. Um, my role as an archivist is fairly new to me. Mm. Um, and we have a very nice 20th century collection of mm. uh, analog things, papers and such. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. both an access so that people can have access to see what's in the collection and mm -hmm. search it easily, but also an access in, because I see a really small funnel through which things were gathered in the school's archives. Mm. And I um, am working with teachers to think about how we get things into the archive from a greater, a more reflective um, uh, uh -huh. Right. Without being overwhelmed by a bunch of stuff that um, we'll never be able to make thoroughly searchable. So, um, my question for you is on a national scale, <laughs> that is truly grand. And what do the National Archives think of in terms of their um, collection, making a collection in terms of taking things in? Right. So we, we are a little bit different than some other, um, like for example, the Smithsonian or the Library of Congress, which, for example, the Library of Congress looks at books that come through copyright, okay, um, just for an example, and then they make selections for the books that are submitted for copyright about what will be part of its permanent collection at the Library of Congress. And, and they have librarians who are trained in subject matter expertise to be able to make selections, like this book definitely we want for the national collection, maybe this one I, for certain reasons, maybe not, okay. But we are not uh, in that way because we take in all of the permanent records of the government of the United States. So we work with the agencies, okay, all, all the federal agencies across the United States government on record schedules, uh, which will, will help determine for how long records will be temporary records and which records will be temporary and which will become, um, will become accessioned and permanent part of the National Archives. So we do have an entire, uh, a really good division that works on um, federal records and its accessioning and those record schedules which come up to me for final approval. So we are not making it would say like choices about what we collect and what we don't because we are collecting all of the permanent records. Out of all the records that are made or created in, in, in the operations of the federal government, we take between one and 3% as a permanent record. So just to give you an idea. And most of those records, uh, they should reflect a large um, a representation of uh, what happens in an agency, but a lot of them are focused on um, the decisions that are made. Uh, to be able to operate um, that particular agency or program. Uh, and those are the ones we absolutely need to capture. So we have a little bit less discretion about what we accession and what we don't because our business is 
the records business and we take it in, you know, at, at that point in time when it is going to be a permanent record. Has that been, have there been changes in, uh, has changes in format come from? Mm -hmm. From paper to website to right. uh, that sort of thing. Has, how has that affected? Oh yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, it doesn't, a record, we, the, the National Archives maintains a record is a record is a record and the format is, is uh, does not determine the validity of, of whether or not you accession a record. It's the substance. Uh, but there has to be you know, changes in practice as the formats have changed over time. There's no doubt about that. So text messages, social media, right? You know, these are very, very different types of, of accessioning than you know, just taking in memos or, or, or pieces of paper or, or print photographs versus digital photographs, right? So all of those things uh, change how they can be accessioned. But once again, a record uh, is based upon the content of the record, not the media in which it was produced, okay? All right, well, I'm gonna go out and uh, see all the tables. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you.